Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to call this meeting of the Taxes Committee to order for March 21st, 2023. First up is approving the minutes for March 17th. Vice Chair Norris. Chair Gomez, I move the minutes from the St. Patrick's Day meeting of the Tax Committee. It was a very special day indeed. Um, all right. Uh, Vice Chair Norris has moved the minutes for March 17th. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Sure. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. Uh, motion prevails. The minutes for March 17th are adopted. All right, so we have a few bills up today. First is House File 583. Chair Newton, welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Chair Gomez and members of the committee. Good I'm, afternoon. I'm bringing my muscle with me. All right. Well, does your muscle want to make a motion to lay this over? <laughs> sure, Chair Gomez. I would move uh, House File 583 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus. Excellent. Vice Chair Norris has moved that uh, House File 583 be laid over. Um, Chair Newton and Vice Chair Norris, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. House File 583 uh, dedicates a portion of the sales tax <coughs> collected from the taxable purchases made at the National Sports Center in uh, Blaine to a new sports account. And that money will be collected. It will be uh, deposited with Department of Revenue, but will be refunded at the end of the year to the uh, National Sports Center. Uh, the estimate is the first year would be 310,000 following years. It would be in the neighborhood of 350,000. Okay. Something you should know we'll about the that. National Sports Center is that they generate roughly uh, $90 million a year in revenue from outside sources coming into Minnesota. Um, you know, and if you just look at the sales tax for people staying in the hotels, buying food, buying articles here, it's probably in the neighborhood of 6, 000, or $6 million that come into the state for other programs that we use uh, that are essential. So with me today, I have uh, Todd Johnson, who's the executive director of the National Sports Center, and he would like to uh, make a presentation, uh, Chair Gomez. Excellent, thank you, Chair Newton. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself as you go ahead with your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Todd Johnson. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission. I also serve as executive director of the National Sports Center Foundation. And uh, actually in, in this role, it's, it's, uh, it's actually a privilege to run this facility that um, some of you may be here, at least your predecessors, I know may, maybe Representative Davids have supported this facility in the past. It is a real gem for the state of Minnesota. We have quite a facility up there, but it's a very skinny facility. So in talking with um, local representative Matt Norris and uh, represent, I always want to call him Senator, Re Re Representative <laughs> Newton, um, we we're trying to think of ways that we could look at um, to get a little bit more revenue. Remember with this facility, we do not receive one operating dollar from the state of Minnesota. And I think it's actually a really unique and an interesting model that works very well. If you look at our competitors who have followed us over the 30 years of our existence, there's one in Arizona right now for $360 million that just filed for bankruptcy. Um, this facility works because we have to make it work and we have to run events and we have to make sure that people come. And uh, we run the third largest soccer tournament in the world. Uh, right now we're on, uh, on a pace to uh, maybe set a record with 1,200 teams. We have 20 countries. 20 states, just talked to some folks from Ukraine who are gonna be coming back. Um, we got a group from South Africa, a lot of teams uh, from Brazil and from Chile. So we're excited about the tournament. Uh, specifics of this, of this bill though are really about the sales tax that we pay on adult hockey. We do not, basically hockey, because that's our, that's our big event is adult hockey and on food, food and beverage. The Department of Revenue, I believe, decided the best way to go about it rather than a straight out exemption is to put it in a special account, w which makes sense to me as well. Uh, however, it, it comes in, it would be great. So basically, if you think about it, we have a $350,000 state budget. We're the, one of the smallest state agencies. And we take that 350,000 and we turn it into a $14.7 million company called the National Sports Center Foundation. None of those people are state employees. There's three of us who are state employees on, 
on the MASC side, we, we make the, the place work as best we can. We're not gonna charge $7 for water. We have a lot of single parents, a lot of folks who are just trying to figure out ways to get their kids into athletics and into sports. We are about as skinny as you can possibly get. I just talked to our ICE programmer. He said we are full every weekend until July 4th. We're completely full all the time. We can't make it though without fundraising. So it, it falls upon me every year, which is fine. I knew it when I took the job. I raised about $1.5 million a year to make that $14.7 million company work. And we do that gladly. It's, it's skinny, it's skinny times, but we, we make it successful. But what that allows us to do, Madam Chair and members of the committee, is to outreach in ways that I don't think there's another facility that does. Uh, for instance, the Minneapolis um, Middle School League, uh, uh, not, not so long ago, the Mi Minneapolis Middle School Soccer Leagues all came up and they, they uh, had their league at our facility. And um, we also have the professional team up there. But I, I'll tell you, the level of events that you can attend from seeing the professional team play, seeing these young men or girls and boys from, from Minneapolis playing on our fields, they're equally as important to us in, in what we do. Um, it is a really unique facility and as as Representative Newton said, the, the fortuitous thing is it's a net profit for revenue for the state of Minnesota. $96 million in a non-COVID year. We bring in $35 million alone from the sports center itself. So with that, this is, is an opportunity for us to literally, um, it's, it is our bottom line on the $14.7 million business that we run. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, is there anyone else in the public who wishes to testify on this bill? Not seeing any two-member uh, discussion. Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a general question. Um, so are you planning on using the money just for general operating expenses or special projects, or what would you actually use the money if you were able to keep the, the portion of the sales tax, and what percentage of the sales tax would that is that? Representative Newton, should we go to your testifier? Uh, or, yes. Yeah, <laughs> great. Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair, Representative, um, to be perfectly honest, I haven't thought about it, except it will not go to operating funds. I think we would, we would set up a separate fund for deferred maintenance. As you know, in, in other committees, we are woefully behind in deferred maintenance at this facility since I took it on. So to the extent we would use it for deferred maintenance, which we do now on the National Sports Center side, um, Ice chillers, as you know, uh, being where you're from, uh, are not cheap. Uh, the dehumidification within that facility, it's, it's now coming up on 30 years old. So there, there, there is a lot of deferred maintenance every year that we're working on. Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, thank you uh, Madam Chair. So you, that's what you will do with it, or for sure? Absolutely. Okay. And then um, just if, if that's what this fund is going for, are you also pursuing a, um, just because I'm sure a lot of your contracts are lump sum contracts, a sales tax exemption on, on, on building materials and when you purchase those new, new items, are you also pursuing that route as well? Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mad Madam Chair, uh, Representative, we already received that as a state entity. Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Even when you sign lump sum contracts? Mr. Chair. So that would be where the, the Madam Chair, that would be where the, the, the construction company actually goes out and purchases the materials on your behalf. Mr. Johnson. You look like you're, you're looking to your, maybe your finance friend up there. <laughs> Excellent. If, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Of course, yeah. Um, if you would just uh, introduce yourself for the record and then uh, if you uh, can answer Representative Sudzinski's question. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Neil Ladd, the Deputy Executive Director for the National Sports Center and the Amateur Sports Commission. Yes, uh, in that regard, the foundation does give that authority to that contractor in a lump sum contract, so we would purchase materials uh, tax exempt. Representative Sudzinski. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Representative Robbins. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and my apologies if I missed the earlier remarks. I was meeting with a constituent, so if somebody already addressed this, I'm sorry. Um, but I saw in the discussion of it that um, the funds would be available for promoting and developing amateur sports throughout Minnesota. And I just wondered how do local communities 
also then participate. And secondly, it also referenced promoting development of an Olympic training center. And I wondered what you might have in mind there. Certainly that goes beyond the stated use of deferred maintenance. Uh, Representative Newton, I assume one of your... Uh, uh, the training center actually is a facility at the ice arena that's used by the uh, U.S. Women's Olympic team. But we, we also have, it's the Loons uh, soccer team. And that's their <coughs> facility where they train and, and uh, people can watch them. Um, but in addition to that, I'll, I'll defer to uh, Mr. Johnson or Mr. Ladd for... I don't know if that if that fully addresses your you. your question, Representative Robinson. I, I'm totally blanking on your name. I'm sorry, sir. Neil Neil. Lad. Mr. Lett. Okay, great. Uh, please go ahead. He's sorry. Lett on the right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, not only is the Team USA there for women's hockey, uh, we've also had Team USA for women's soccer. Uh, utilizing the facility, so it, it, multiple different sports have called um, this facility home. Community Olympic Development Program over the years has also been home there. So, uh, it, multiple uh, different um, groups have used the facility that way. In regards to statewide, um, you know, it could be looked in a couple different ways. Obviously, with um, teams from all over the state coming in to utilize the facility, that's one way that they can partake in those funds being reinvested into amateur sports give more opportunities for people in the state of Minnesota to recreate. So uh, just to clarify to Representative Robbins' question, what are you going to be using the money in the special revenue account for? Is it the deferred maintenance of the facility? Is it the promotion of youth sports across the state? Or is it this Olympic thing? Could you just, we want to get a really clear answer on that if we could. Madam Chair, members, I would say all the above, but I'll, I'll defer to Todd if he has another answer. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, members yes, of the committee, Mr. Todd Johnson. Johnson. Um, it, it is a really good question, Representative. It really would be used for deferred maintenance, but it's hard not to say that the deferred maintenance isn't used a on a statewide basis for everyone who comes down. We have two primary missions, to create economic impact through sports tourism, number one, and number two is to provide athletic facilities for the citizens of the state of Minnesota. Uh, we do that in multiple ways, and, and Representative, maybe what you're referring to is we also administer a number of grant programs when there are funds available in those grant programs. One specifically is the Mighty Ducks program, where we initially, that program was set up before my time, it was set up to build more ice rinks, and I actually think it's one of the most, uh, writing a paper on it actually, it's one of the most um, intentional public policy interventions in sport in the country, I believe. Uh, for women's athletics and for girls' athletics to happen is what you as a legislature have done for the sport of hockey. It's not even close because of what happened with Mighty Ducks. There just simply weren't enough rinks 25 years ago, 20 years ago for everyone to participate. Um, your predecessors, Phyllis Kahn, <coughs> others came forward with this legislation. Bob Milbert, it was named after, um, who was very active in it. That created a fund of money to get some of those ice rinks built all around the state. Now there's a second round of that money to help them replace refrigerants that are now illegal. LR22 is a refrigerant that you can no longer buy. So most ice arenas around the state of Minnesota and around the country are converting to ammonia. So it's, a, it's an expensive process. So that grant, grant program does go throughout the state of Minnesota as well. Right, but that doesn't. Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm just going to the bill, and it says on line 1.10 that the money is appropriated for the promotion and development of amateur sports as provided in section 248.04. So, um, I mean, it just sounds like it's a different use, I guess, than what it says in the bill. If it's for maintenance, that doesn't, I don't think that's the same as what it says in the bill, I guess, is what I would say. Um, and I don't know if there's any, if anybody has a comment on that. I, I also just had a question about, because you had referred to other committees. Um, so do you have, is there like a bonding request that you're making or some other committee that, um, where there's money flowing to this uh, facility this year or a proposal for it? Madam uh, Chair, yes, we are in the, in the bonding bill as well. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Representative Robbins? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for those answers. I, I think it helps me understand it a little bit. I, I guess I have some concerns about why we need to create a special revenue account. I mean, if you are going to bonding for additional resources, um, I, I, I might think a, just a direct appropriation if you need it beyond bonding might be better than just creating an ongoing special revenue account. Um, but, you know, I'll wait to have a further committee discussion on that. I just, I'm not sure why that, maybe perhaps you could ask, why are you taking that approach? Why is that necessary? Mr. Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative, uh, when I originally thought about the bill, I thought about just a straight exemption, and this is what uh, the Department of Revenue preferred. Um, which, which I, I totally understand why they would want to do that. I think if, um, if you think about bonding proposals, normally those are need a 20-year shelf life for, for those repairs, and some of our repairs are more needed than that uh, on a year, yearly, year in, year out basis on, on things that need to be. We have a 700-acre campus. Um, we have eight sheets of ice. We're the largest ice facility in the world. We have the largest um, inflatable dome in, in the world. Uh, we have a lot of facilities that we need to take care of and try to do most of that through fees and through, through uh, participation, but we fall short every year. Representative Robbins. Thank you. That really is helpful to know DOR suggested it, so I appreciate the, the time for asking these questions. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Representative Swazinski. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and to the testifiers, just looking at, you know, so the amateur sports, you have that, but there's also the regional amateur sports centers around the state. So I think Bemidji has one, Marshall has one. I think there's a proposal of having nine. I'm not sure what number that is as far as which ones have been fleshed out. Will those facilities also potentially benefit from this? Um, it, if they're generating sales tax within their communities or is this only going to go to yours or would you consider allowing those other facilities that are regional amateur sports that are essentially, I think they're connected to you somehow, would also potentially uh, be able to either have this or have an amendment to this bill that would have those those dollars stay in the in those communities for, for deferred maintenance or, or the, um, I mean, that's a good question because it seems like that was different than what we heard. But. Um. Mr. Johnson, or I, is there, you're looking, do you want to answer this? Would you like somebody else to? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I hate to speak in front of the, uh, the author of the bill. So if, if, if uh, Representative Moon got something to say, I, I would say something. Um, I would say absolute. Um, <laughs> this, this applies, this language is for the National Sports Center, and I know it, you asked what our role is in some of those other facilities. The Minnesota National Sports Commission has served over time as a fiscal agent for those entities to get state white bonds. We don't have any operating uh, responsibilities for any other facilities, whether it's Rochester or Marshall or, or um, up in St. Cloud at the Fruit Brook Brink. We, we simply were the fiscal agent and obviously the proponent to make sure that more sports facilities got built. We have no operational, as you know, at least in Marshall, we have no operational authority at all. Representative Thank Swinsinski. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so just so if this money is put into an account, I know you've got other bills, other places. I know there was a, in the Energy Committee, there was a $600 million or $6 million proposal for, to purchase solar panels, but also to replace the roof on part of this. How would this account, would that supplement that as far as the roof or, or no? Mr. Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative I'll, I'll, Newton, I, I apologize. I should have gone to you yeah. for a response uh, to the last, but. Swazinski, no, this is, this is separate. The uh, solar on the roof is essentially to defer the, or reduce the costs of, of uh, keeping that ice cold. With six sheets of ice, uh, the electric bill runs about a million dollars a year. And so the solar would be used on, not only on the roof of the ice arena, but also on the maintenance facility. Thank you. You good? Uh, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair, and probably more questions on this bill than uh, maybe the authors anticipated, but uh, you know, uh, I think many of us here, especially as a father of a couple young uh, soccer players, uh, appreciate what, the, uh, what you guys do up in Blaine, and you've got some good representatives here for you, but um, I had previously looked up a 240A.04, and it's pretty broad. So I, I, from what I'm kind of gathering from the conversation is that maybe we need to narrow the scope 
and be a little more clear in the intent of the, the sales tax uh, refund here. Um, you know, it started out as repairs and renovations. Representative Sudinski and a couple others have brought up a couple other uh, good points about where the funds would be used. So I might suggest uh, that we narrow this if the chair includes it or um, in a bill or, or maybe the author wants to try to do that. Uh, there was uh, just today I, I heard the bill for the solar panels of about eight hundred thousand dollars or eight eight hundred and fifty. The break even on that is about the lifespan of the solar panels. So it might be easier and less expensive to just pay their electric bill. But uh, that that's a different issue. But I I, I like what the uh, facility does and it plays an important role in youth sports. Um, I think this bill needs a little bit more work and I just narrowing what they want to use the funds for if it's uh, repair and renovations I think uh, that's a you can make that argument um, but just to have uh, as provided in section 248.04 is a uh, quite broad and I think uh, you might get more more uh, agreement from our side or even on your side um, if that was a little more narrowed uh, to to the specific use of, of how you want to use that. But um, keep up the good work of what you're doing up there uh, in that particular facility. Uh, it is a lot of fun for the kids, and those are memories that they're creating. Um, but hopefully we can do a little bit more work on this bill. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Not seeing any. Uh, to Representative Newton and Vice Chair Norris, if anybody has any closing comments. Thank you, Chair Gomez, and I, I want to thank my colleague uh, and from the neighboring district, uh, Representative Newton, for uh, bringing this bill forward. And uh, I think this is part of his kind of unfinished business here in, in the legislature and appreciate uh, his efforts on this. I'm, I'm proud to be uh, the, the home of the National Sports Center in my district. And you know, as you heard uh, Mr. Johnson say, we really we bring the world uh, to Minnesota at the National Sports Center. Uh, you may, you know, and it's a fair question to say, you know, is it, it is, does it make sense to be spending state dollars on facilities like these? And, and I would argue that when you look at the economic benefit uh, that the National Sports Center generates for our state in terms of economic activity, jobs, tax revenue, um, that it is a, a net positive for our state. Uh, that uh, and we're, we're seeing issues where because of the deferred maintenance on the facility uh, we're not able to always keep up with some of the other facilities in, in other states and we risk losing tournaments and the economic activity that those generate for our state so I think this is uh, a one that produces a good ROI for the state and would encourage the committee uh, to strongly uh, consider including this in the omnibus tax bill thank you very much uh, chair Newton yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and members of the committee for hearing this bill. I think this gives us an opportunity to um, to take care of a, a facility. When something breaks down, you get a piece of major equipment breaks down, something happens in the ice arena, this additional money would be there to, to take care of that. And Representative Swadzinski, I, I agree with you actually. You know, if we can modify this bill to make sure that we take a beat care of the other facilities that are under the auspices of the uh, Amateur Sports Commission. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members, for hearing the bill. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, with that, uh, Vice Chair Norris is going to renew his motion that House File 583 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Tax Bill, and it is laid over. Next up, uh, Chair Lissagard um, with House File 2905. Chair Lissagard, would you like to move your bill or move that it be laid over? So move. Excellent. Chair, Chair Lissagard is going to move that House File 2905 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. To your bill. Welcome Good afternoon, your Madam Chair and members. Thank you for the opportunity to present House File 2905. Um, the bill modifies the required supplemental information for truth in taxation notices. Uh, this change is at the request of the property tax administrators throughout the state through the Minnesota Association of County Officers. This bill is updating the law passed in 2021 that requires supplemental information about county, cities, towns, and school budgets to provide as a part of the truth in taxation mailing. And with me, I have a testifier that can go into more detail and understands this process much better than I do. 
All right, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Gomez, members of the committee. My name is Julie Hansen. I'm the Property and Customer Service Manager for Scott County. I'm here today to, on behalf of the Minnesota Association of County Officers. MAKO represents all 87 counties, auditors, treasurers, recorders, and finance officers, including county property tax administrators. I'm here to express our association's strong support and our appreciation of Representative Liz Lagarde's work on House File 2905, which modifies the requirements for the supplemental information required in the Truth in Taxation notices. Um, you know this is government. We appreciate our acronyms. Uh, we call these TNTs, so I will refer to those as such later. While the changes in the bill may seem minor, they are the direct result of our association and are extremely important. MAKO's members strive to be good administrators of the property tax system. We support legislative efforts to create a more understandable system for taxpayers. During the 2022 legislative session, a new supplemental information sheet was required as part of the TNT mailing process. The sheet was to provide detailed budget information about revenues and expenditures for counties, cities, and schools. As our association attempted to implement this law, we learned that due to school finance calendars, nearly every school was unable to provide the details needed. Furthermore, as we laid out the information from the counties and cities, we recognized that the amount of data could be overwhelming to taxpayers. We have an actual TNT supplemental information sheet, which I believe was provided if anyone wishes to see the amount of data. As a response to these concerns, we've had follow-up discussions and meetings to try and find a better way to educate taxpayers about the budgeting process. We feel the best way to do this is to provide some information about property tax levies for the county and all the cities and school districts within that county. We believe this information informs the taxpayer, taxpayer on a very predominant feature that impacts their property tax bill and allows them to to compare year over year changes among other things. We also envision providing explanatory information about how and when a taxpayer should provide feedback on the levies, where they can learn more information and what the impact of levies are. This proposal is what we consider to be a win-win. It provides information that taxpayers may find valuable and helpful. It provides more bite-sized and understandable information in regard to levies. It also creates efficiencies in reporting, printing, and mailing this information for counties, cities, and schools. Because our association is always looking for opportunities for improvement, this bill also requires local government website addresses to be provided if available, as we know property taxpayers may want access to additional information that many of our county, cities, and schools already provide. This bill gives county discretion on requiring cities, towns, and schools to pay their portion of the mailing costs. Current law requires counties to bill back. We have heard from counties that they would like the flexibility to not charge back when it's not cost effective. <clears throat> we also want to express our appreciation for Department of Revenue Commissioner Marquardt's attention to this matter. As then chair of the tax committee, he was a proponent of the changes to create the supplemental information sheet. Commissioner Marcourt has been very willing and interested to continue to improve this information sheet and supports the proposal in front of the committee. In closing, we also want to thank the representative for bringing this proposal forward for the committee's consideration of it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, MAKO does support House File 2905. We appreciate your attention and consideration to improve the TNT notice information. I'll conclude my testimony, but I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us and thanks for your work. Um, is there any discussion to House File 2905 or questions from members? Representative Robbins. I'll jump. I'm not sure I know what I'm asking, but I'm, I, I'm a little bit um, trying to understand where this will leave the taxpayer. So it says um, that now they just have to talk about change in pro proposed levies, but do they still have to talk about it in terms of the change for each city, each school district, you know, each subunit of government? And second question is, does it show how that levy will impact 
that cha that proposed change in levy will impact that taxpayer? Ms. Hansen, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Chair Gomez, Representative. Um, to the first part of your question, yes, it does require um, each individual jurisdiction to report um, and gives the economic impact for each taxpayer. Um, I've seen, I've testified on quite a few bills um, already this year, and a very common theme that I see is easing confusion. Um, that really is the goal of this. We have found that counties, cities, school districts are already providing a lot of budget information, but what folks really care about in the end isn't really the budget, it's the levy. It's the impact to the individual taxpayer. So we do feel that this provides a, a lot more clarity, eases a lot of confusion. Um, I hope that answers your question. Representative Robbins, good. Okay. Great, um, any further discussion? Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair, and as uh, redistricting allowed me to have uh, Scott, portions of Scott County into my district, I appreciate your testi testimony and your work here. Um, the property that I own is in Dakota County, and when we get our tax statements, uh, we get a little quarter sheet flyer that has a breakdown of the city, the school district, and the county, and some neat pie diagrams that show what percentage increase and part of the levy and, uh, provides some good information. I know you're not from Dakota County, but so currently is that being paid for by Dakota County with information provided by those other uh, local jurisdictions? And then this bill would allow Dakota, uh, a county like Dakota to share that cost uh, that they, they print up for the taxpayers uh, among those jurisdictions then? Ms. Hansen. Chair Gomez, Representative. Um, I, yes, I'm not from Dakota County. I can't speak to their costs directly. Um, but this bill actually would flip that a little bit on its head. Um, right now, currently, we are required to bill back. Um, and I know in the elections world as well, I am allowed to bill back, but sometimes it really doesn't make sense to do so. Um, <coughs> to spend the time to analyze the costs sometimes far exceeds the reimbursement you're going to get. Um, so this bill allows us to just absorb that cost if we choose, rather than to spend the administrative time to bill back. Does that answer your question? Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it, it does uh, provide some insight in, into that. Um, I still think taxpayers, you know, more information is better, but I appreciate your efforts and uh, I'll have to see what uh, Dakota County, how they're billing that. You've got me curious now. Uh, Representative Elkins. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think my, the same line of questioning is Representative Kosnick. So where I am in Hennepin County, the, the statement that I get uh, only includes the levy information for the various districts where I live. Um, but at the same time, um, when we receive the truth and taxation, taxation statement, uh, there's usually also a, um, an insert that was printed by the city at its expense, but you know, put into the county envelope for we receive, which has more detailed breakdowns of, the, of how our city's property tax bill is put together. There isn't anything in this bill that would prevent that practice from continuing, is there? Would there? Ms. Hanson. Mm -hmm. Chair Gomez, Representative Elkins, no. Okay. There's nothing prohibiting um, cities, local jurisdictions from providing more information should they choose. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, not seeing any. Um, any final words? Chair Lissagard. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, easing confusion has got to be a good bill. Thank you. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, with that, um, Chair Lissagard is going to renew his motion that House File 2905 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill, and it is laid over. Next up, House File 1056, Representative Edelson. Welcome to the committee. We're happy to have you in taxes. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to move that um, House File 1056, be the first engrossment, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. And Representative Edelson, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Well, 
I mean, five years here, and I've never been to Texas. I just mm -hmm. find this so surprising. All right, well, <laughs> I mean, welcome. We're happy you're f you've finally made your way by. You want to throw any you know tax cuts to Edina? We'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> I think there'll be bipartisan opposition to that. All right, so um, today is an important step. Sorry, I'm going to try to get serious here. Today is an important step to protect victims of sexual assault and violence. Minnesota follows federal law in taxation of settlements of personal injury claims. And in both cases, um, Minnesota, we, we conform to federal law. We do not tax those settlements. The bill before you today, um, what it does is it looks at uh, when there is an NDA and not, when there's not an NDA, saying that if there, a sexual harassment has been established and a company has agreed to pay that, that in that instance, Minnesota, what I'm asking today before this bill is that we can impact federal law, but we can impact Minnesota law. Victims right now are being paid out with severance and severance is called, it's in wages. So they, they are witnessing a lot of problems around uh, staying employed at that same employer. Um, but what we're asking for is that it to be paid as a settlement that we not tax that settlement. Um, it, for the state of Minnesota. And so it's a pretty straightforward bill. Um, I, I think it's an important one because if you think about when some, a victim oftentimes do not have attorneys in these scenarios, um, they don't understand, they just wanna get out of the bad situation. They don't understand sometimes in those moments that they're, they will be taxed on that. And so it, it usually ends up being a shock. And so with that, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm happy to go to my testifier. Excellent, thank you. Um, welcome to the committee. Uh, please just introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee and Representative Edelson. My name is Julie Risser. In 2014, I signed a non-disclosure agreement with my previous employer for sexual harassment. At that time, I didn't know that NDAs really aren't regulated. The term in the agreement was settlement, not severance. There was nothing about income taxes. When payment came as severance pay lump sum for 80 hours of work conducted over a two week pay period with start and end dates, I was stunned. It was 61% of what I thought I would get. The state of Minnesota received 6.25% of my settlement, Medicare, Social Security, and the feds all took their cuts. I was left with a sliver of the validation I had agreed to. When I subtracted attorney's fees, I came away with about 11%, a little less than that. Classifying the payment as wages also meant I could not access my unemployment benefits. They stopped. They couldn't continue until the severance pay had been prorated out. I received a letter informing me that a determination of overpayment of unemployment benefits had occurred. I couldn't use the settlement funds to retrain. They had to go to living expenses. My expertise was narrow. I would have to have moved out of state for a job that matched my skills. Minnesota has a tight labor market. House file 1056 would help people entering into settlement agreements have more resources for retraining. Um, finally, paying settlement as severance enables employers to deduct the cost and conceal harassment and risk it's common for people who report harassment to lose their jobs, while those who harass remain employed, get promoted, and gain power over more people. So in a sense, what the status quo does is contribute to people being laid off and collecting unemployment. Um, it revictimizes and shores up systemic gender inequities. I vividly remember seeing the cut Minnesota got from my sexual harassment settlement. Minnesota can do better by victims of on-the-job sexual harassment. House file 1056 will stop others from having this experience. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much for sharing your story with us, Ms. Risser. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, what, should we, is it okay if we finish with testimony? Okay. We just have one more testifier, and then we'll move to member discussion. So welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Hi. My name is Sarah Florman. I'm the public policy manager at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. We represent more than 63 domestic and sexual assault programs serving victim survivors in all 87 Minnesota counties. Victim survivors of workplace harassment and abuse experience significant trauma. We believe that allowing employers to make abuse settlement payments as severance compounds that harm and allows employers to hide record of wrongdoing. 
Severance pay indicates that an employee was simply let go, whereas a record of settlement indicates that wrongdoing. A victim survivor receives less money if they are paid severance because it's subject to federal income tax, and people who receive severance are also not eligible for unemployment benefits, which can cause financial insecurity for victims. Severance pay is also tax deductible, meaning that an employer could claim a sexual harassment settlement as a business expense on their taxes. Victim survivors of harassment or abuse face lost wages, unexpected medical and mental health costs, and barriers to accessing unemployment benefits. Many victim survivors lose their jobs or are forced to quit because their safety and well-being are at risk. They may also miss out on career advancement opportunities, which means lost future wages. A study conducted by the Institute for Women's Policy Research found considerable financial stress as a result of such job change, highlighting long-term consequences of harassment for earnings and career attainment. Harassment contrib contributed to financial strain even when victim survivors were able to find work soon after leaving their previous employment. Settlements can ease those financial burdens. A settlement may also represent a victim survivor's best chance to get some form of justice and protect a victim survivor's right to speak about their experience. Everyone deserves to be treated with dignity and respect at work. Employers should not be able to hide wrongdoing or prevent damaging their reputation or claim a sexual harassment as a tax deductible business expense. Please support victim survivors by prohibiting payment of sexual harassment settlements as severance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wants to testify on this? Uh, not seeing any, uh, Representative Davids. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to thank the author for bringing this bill before the tax committee. Uh, I think it's a good bill, and I think it should be taxed uh, in accordance with what this bill does. Thank you. Uh, Representative Swidzinski. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just just a, a question of clarification when it comes to if, does it have to be the actual business that is uh, doing the sexual harassing for this to count, or can it be another uh, employee that is doing the sexual harassing? Representative Edelson. Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Swazinski, uh, usually what happens in this instance um, is if there is another employee that is doing it, the business would usually settle in, in on behalf because it is happening within that workplace. Representative Swazinski. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Representative Edelson, any closing comments you would like to leave us with? Well, I want to thank you, Madam Chair, and all the members. Um, what seems like a small bill will make a, a really big difference in, in a victim's lives. And uh, thank, Rep thank you, Representative Davids, for that. I hope you'll sign on to the bill. Um, and just thank you all for your time today. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Um, with that, I'm going to renew my motion that um, House File 1056, the first engrossment, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. And it is laid over. Uh, next up, Representative Brand. Where did he go? Is he... Oh, he's outside. Okay. Uh, Norris, are you ready? Do you want to go first? Where's Norris? Okay, he's gone too. Uh, just a second. We're going to retrieve our wayward members from the hallway, apparently. Um, get right back to it. Yes, Representative Davids. Okay, maybe we should. Uh... Can I get one? A witness? Can you get a witness? <laughs> Are we already getting tax bill songs? I'm, I'm, oh. <laughs> I'm sure I'm working very hard on this. I'm waiting but with bated breath, as you could imagine. I know, I know. Um. <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. Uh, huh? We just say I and lay them all over. You don't get to vote on laying things over, so you could say I all you want, I guess. <laughs> You're supposed to keep repeating it. Brand. Brand. Anyone? Brand. Anyone? No. There was this time our first, uh, my first year in, in session when we were like there at three in the morning and we were just like, it was silent and suddenly it just everybody in unison started um, the Jeopardy like the music like da, 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 da. it was like very uncanny but hopefully we, we won't have to resort to isn't that the, the Jeopardy like during Final Jeopardy or something I, yeah I think so um. oh. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Feeling our awkward silence. Are, is any of them out there? Or what are they doing? Okay. Madam <laughs> Chair. Yes, Representative Davids. I carried this bill previously, and I think that I know Elizabeth Gard did. So. What, do you want to get up there? You want to get up there and present the bill? Is that what you're saying? Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> it's a great bill. I know. Did you? You didn't retrieve any of any wayward members while you were in the hallway, Andy? I did not. I didn't see any. If that makes it. <laughs> there he is. Thank you. All right. Well, so we're Representative Brand has a uh, House File 1171, and he's uh, going to move that uh, House File 1171 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. Representative Brand, welcome to your committee. Thank you welcome back. Yes, Madam uh, Chair, that's my motion for House File 1171. So just to give you a little bit of a background about the bill. In 1940, the U.S. Agriculture Census reported 30% of farms in Minnesota had electricity. By 1946, that number grew to almost 80%. Uh, this is the era in Minnesota because it was really transformational uh, time for people who especially lived in greater Minnesota to get electricity. Uh, that changed people's <laughs> lives. In 1939, a property tax exemption for co-op distribution was enacted to help nonprofit cooperative utilities reduce the cost of providing essential electric service in rural areas where the cost of service delivery was the highest. Uh, the statute is 273.41, for those who, who uh, care, uh, which uh, states, quote, a cooperative association will pay a tax of $10 for each 100 members or fractional thereof in lieu of all personal property taxes, state, county, or local upon distribution lines and attachments and appurtenances thereto of such associations located in rural areas. The phrase distribution lines and the attachments and appurtenances thereto is why I'm here today to talk about House File 11, or 1711. I'm sorry, 1171. After interpreting this law correctly for 80 years, the Department of Revenue um, decided to change the property tax exemption for a cooperative distribution lines and no longer applied to its attachments or pertinences like meters, streetlights, and load control receivers. As a result, the tax market value of at least one Minnesota co-op of 50 across our state has doubled since 2018. I'm asking for bipartisan consensus in this year's omnibus tax bill to reaffirm that the property tax exemption applies to all attachments and appurtenances connected to a rural cooperative's distribution system. The consensus language reads in the bill, for purposes of this section, attach attachments and appurtenances included but not limited to all cooperative association owned metering and street lighting equipment that it physically or electrically connected to the co-op association's distribution system. I am hopeful that we can have a good discussion today in the committee um, and that we can come to an agreement that this is in the best interest of ratepayers in greater Minnesota. And without that, or without any more, I will turn it over to my testifier and I look forward to any questions or comments you have. Excellent. Welcome to the committee. Please just introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Brian Crambier, and I'm the president and CEO of My Energy Cooperative, an electric distribution cooperative headquartered in Rushford, Minnesota. My Energy provides electric service directly to over 19,000 members in southeastern Minnesota with 5,500 miles of line. Like other electric co-ops, we serve a large geographic area with low population density, which in our case is less than four members per mile of line. I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Rural Electric Association, which is an association that re represents my energy and 43 other Minnesota-based electric distribution co-ops. Together, we serve 1.7 million member owners throughout Minnesota, which equates to roughly one-third of the state's population. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on House File 1171 related to property taxes on rural electric cooperative distribution infrastructure. We've been working on this legislation for the last two years and we're looking forward to a resolution this year. As part of getting electric service out to rural Minnesota in 1939, the legislature enacted a law under which Minnesota's electric co-ops pay a $10 per 100 member fee 
in lieu of property taxes on cooperative distribution equipment outside of incorporated areas. That law codified into section 273.41 was enacted to help reduce the high cost of providing electric service in rural Minnesota where those that we serve are in densely geographic areas. Nonprofit rural electric co-ops have relied on this tax exemption to help us provide affordable electric service to rural communities throughout Minnesota for the past 80 years. Section 273.41 states that co-ops will pay a tax of $10 for each 100 members or fraction thereof in lieu of all personal taxes, state, county, or local upon distribution lines and attachments and appurtenances thereto of such associations located in rural areas. This property tax exemption is critical to ensure Minnesota's, Minnesotans in rural areas receive necessary electric service at affordable prices. Beginning in 1939 and for 80 years thereof, this exemption for co-ops distribution facilities was implemented faithfully by the Minnesota Department of Revenue for all electric co-ops in Minnesota. However, in 2019, for the first time in 80 years, the Department of Revenue began imposing property taxes on cooperative meters and street lights in rural areas. Even more recently, the department has started imposing property taxes on cooperative load control receivers that we install in our members' homes that are part of our energy efficiency program. This new interpretation, which imposes property taxes on thousands of meters and street lights connected to cooperative distribution lines for the first time in 80 years, substantially increases the cost of providing essential electric service to our rural members. This is problematic given the particularly high cost of serving the rural areas. Specifically, in our case, the department's new assessment increased our property tax valuation from $13 million to $17 million in 2022. To address this problem, problem, the legislature last year came to a bipartisan consensus on language on the omnibus tax bill, reaffirming the property tax exemption applies to the attachments and appurtenances connected to a rural cooperative's distribution system. That clarifying language was not opposed by the Department of Revenue or any other party, and it's now incorporated into House File 1171. The saying language was included in the Bipartisan Tax Conference Committee report last year. The MREA has met with Commissioner Marquardt yesterday and confirmed no agency opposition to this language. On behalf of all of 44 electric distribution co-ops in Minnesota, and more importantly, our $1.7 million member owners, I ask for your support in passing this legislation, which really will align our tax policy with its 80-year history and in help ensure affordable, reliable electric service in rural Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I especially want to thank Representative Brand, Representative Lisgard, and Representative Davids for supporting this legislation. Madam Chair, I would stand for any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, before we move to member discussion, um, I didn't. we didn't move the author's amendment. Yep. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, Rep. Brand, do you want to move the A1? Yes, Madam Chair. Excellent. It, it's just an implementation date, I think, right? So is there any discussion on the motion to adopt the A1? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion carries. Uh, the A1 amendment to House File 1171 is adopted. All right. Now to member discussion. Representative Davids. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Cranbeer. Thank you for your testimony. You took about half my speech away, uh, but I think that you really laid it out very succinctly as to what happened. And when this did happen, I was basically stunned. I mean, I went to the department and said, what are you doing? Uh, I was horrified, mortified, and terrified as to what they had done. I mean, 80 years of obeying the law, and then all of a sudden, we're not going by the law. And so half of my speech is moot today because in, in your testimony saying that the department supports this, and I believe the Liz Lagarde bill last year was included in the Omnibus Tax Bill Conference Report. Mm -hmm. um, this is one, and we made offers before, this is one where if we could just do this on its own, get her through, get this thing done, locked down, uh, this side of the aisle would be, uh, there would be no, you know, no shenanigans, Tom Foley or chicanery. It'd be just... Let's do this. Uh, no amendments. Uh, let's let's just get this through. Uh, what the department did is they raised the rates on every customer of the rural electric cooperatives. 
is what they did. With nothing in statute to allow it, it just appeared out of the clear blue. And they started this money grab that hopefully we can put an end to uh, very, very quickly. So uh, some of my questions have been answered here. Uh, the department supports, I think that's great. Uh, but we really need to get this done. If we could do it standalone, let's let's get it through and uh, and get this uh, tax that came out of the clear blue, came out of the sky somewhere, uh, and was put on our rural electric coppers. Really regressive, really hurting the poorest of the poor taxpayers uh, that that are members of the rural cooperatives. And so, Mr. Cranbeer, thank you. Uh, Representative Brand, thank you. Uh, and uh, Representative Lizelgard had worked on this, Chair Lizelgard had worked on this, and, and we thought we got her done last year, not quite, didn't quite get across the finish line. So uh, thank you very much, and I, I hope all members can support this being in the omnibus tax bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Davids. Uh, Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just looking at the bill, um, this deals primarily with uh, local property taxes that are being assessed. Am I correct? So like at the county or township level? Mr. Crambeer? Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, yes, it addresses uh, how we are taxed. And, and I would like to clarify, uh, Representative, that when you take a look at my energy and our property taxes that we're being paid or will pay in 2022, we will pay over $600,000 in property taxes. We're taxed on our substations, our electric cooperative headquarters facilities, our outpost facilities. This just addresses the rural distribution lines that we have uh, in our rural areas. So to answer your question, yes. Thank you. Madam Representative Chair. Representative Swidzinski. So just kind of just general question. So what what is the estimate across the state that will be local property taxes? Does this shift these property taxes onto other uh, taxpayers? Uh, Madam Chair, yes. Representative, Mr. I would Finger. ask my, uh, my colleague to, to address that, Dan Lipschel. No, you're fine. Yep. Welcome to the committee. Um, please just state your name for the record and go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I'm Dan Lipschultz uh, here on behalf of the MREA. Uh, you know, I, I think I would just go back to 2019. Um, and at that time uh, and for 80 years prior to that, these facilities were not subject to property taxes. They were subject to that fee, um, the $10 per 100 member fee. Um, in 2019, a shift took place, and it took place because of an interpretation by the Department of Revenue for the first time in 80 years that set odds with the language of the statute. Um, and so um, uh, it does shift. The problem here is that the shift took place in 2019 without any change in the law to justify that shift. And I also want to clarify, right now, so far, there have been five of the 44 distribution co-ops have had these facilities suddenly taxed starting in around 2019. So it's sort of ad hoc. So the shift away from the 80-year history has come sort of slowly in a trickle, and so far only applies to five of the 44 distribution co-ops. So the amount that has shifted since 2019 is not a lot, but that's essentially, in a nutshell, what this shift is all about. Thank Representative Swinsinski. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So that's so for those five distribution networks, that is what the reflection is in the, the general cost? Or are we talking about what would be the whole cost if all 44 cooperatives it had been instead of an ad hoc situation? Mr. Madam, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Swinsinski, I don't know for sure what that number from the Department of Revenue is. Um, so the Department of Revenue would have to answer that question. I've been assuming that that amount relates to those five co-ops, but I don't know that for sure. Representative Swidzinski. If, if the chair, we could follow up with the Department of Revenue, that would be interesting to know. But also, you know, if, if we're seeing a shift, so obviously this was not the legislator's intention that this would be interpreted this way in 2019, that this would go ahead, but the idea that we would simply lift the tax for the ratepayers within the, the community of uh, their distribution network, but then that tax simply gets pushed back onto uh, property tax owners, um, which are the same people within those five groups. You know, it would be my estimate that it would be nice that if, if the state would 
would back that up and, and not push those taxes back onto local property taxes. But because of the interpretation from the state that those five units you know, created that tax, they're spending money or raise taxes. I'm sure they didn't cut taxes locally, but that they, the, the local property taxes would be held harmless as well. Great, thank you. Um, Representative Davids. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't believe this is a shift. It's a shaft. No, no, I'm sorry. Um, I don't think this is a property tax shift because the money the department is collecting, I believe, goes in the general fund. And so what would happen is less money would go in the general fund and it wouldn't be put on to property taxpayers. Uh, maybe Ms. Templin can help us, Madam Chair, or somebody. Ms. Schill? Ms. Schill. Um, Madam Chair and Representative Davids and members, um, according to the revenue estimate, it's talking about a shift in property taxes away from the co-ops. And so um, the question associated um, before, is it five co-ops or 44? I don't know. But um, these are local property taxes and this would not be um, a direct impact on the state general fund, but only an indirect once that shift has happened on what we pay in property tax refunds. That's what the revenue <clears throat> estimate addresses. We can certainly get more information um, underlying those assumptions in the estimate if the committee would like that. Representative Davids. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and to Ms. Schill, the money that's collected by the Department of Revenue since 2019, where does that money go? Ms. Schill. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Davids, um, these are property taxes, and so these, these are property taxes collected at the local level, not collected um, to by the state in particular. This is different than um, utility taxes, and I might uh, ask my colleague, Mr. Swanson, if he has more information on this. Mr. Swanson. Uh, Madam Chair and, and members, uh, Ms. Schill is right. So this is the, the sort of the change that's been discussed that happened in 2019, um, made portions of these um, uh, utility co-op property taxable. The effect of that is that um, you know, portions of that property property ended up in the local jurisdiction's tax base. Oh. So um, the, the, the local levies were applied to this tax base, and that's um, sort of the shifting that Ms. Schill mentioned is, um, is for the most part, the, the local property taxes. So, Representative Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, Mr. Swanson, you're saying that Ms. Schill is right and I'm wrong. Uh, we'll, we'll just move on, okay, I think. Okay, ne next um, issue. <laughs> All right, is there any further uh, discussion or any questions? Representative Swidzinski. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. It, so do we know what the local impact would be? So do we know the amount of property taxes? Ms. Schill, I, I don't know, I don't see a, a local uh, note, but or uh, runs for the shifts. But. Madam Chair and Representative Swidzinski, once again, in the revenue estimate, the amount listed there is $530,000 in property taxes. Uh, and so we can reach back and see how much value of um, the property that's in question here. Once again, it would be another uh, dig deeper request of Department of Revenue into the assumptions in the estimate. Representative Sudzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So that would be my guess is per, per year, not after the duration, because the duration of the bill is 10 years. Is that correct from the... It's forever, I mean... I think it's a, a I'll just what go to I Mr. Read? Swanson, how about for that one? Uh, Madam Chair, okay. Representative Swazinski, <laughs> under the bill, this change would be permanent. Okay, so I, it was a different bill. I was reading that had a 10 year window, so sorry, thank you. Uh, Ms. Schill. And uh, Madam Chair and members, also, this would begin with assessment year 2024, mm -hmm. and so it wouldn't be until taxes payable 2025 mm -hmm. before any of this would uh, be recognized. Representative Sudzinski, good. All right, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Representative Brand. I really like having discussions in this committee because they are very good conversations, very good discussions. Um, I, I thank you for having this opportunity to, to talk about this. I just think that if you look back at that statute, the last time the legislature actually modified 
273.41 was back in 2005. Um, since then, the department has changed how they collect taxes and really without any um, <coughs> communication with the people that are involved. And I think that this is an opportunity for us to really go back to what the intent of that bill was back in 1939 all the way up until now. Um, it's a matter of, I think, um, just addressing that issue and um, protecting the co-ops so they can continue to do the things they have to do to, uh, to, to make sure that the lights turn on uh, affordably across our state. So uh, I just want to renew my motion that we uh, consider this to be laid over for the omnibus tax bill. Thank you so much. So Representative Brand um, has renewed his motion that House File 1711, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill, and it is laid over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, finally, uh, House File 1635, Representative Norris. Uh, Vice Chair Norris is going to, I assume, move that his bill be laid over. That's a correct assumption, Jim. All right, excellent. This bill is so moved. Um, so uh, Representative Norris has moved that House File 1635, the first engrossment, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. Um, Representative Norris, you have an author's amendment. That is correct, Chair Gomez. All right, so Representative Norris is going to move the A3 amendment. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, the motion prevails. The amendment is adopted, and uh, 1635 is in the shape the author would like. Uh, Representative Norris, to your bill. Thank you, Chair Gomez and, and members. Uh, one of the biggest causes of our housing affordability crisis is the lack of inventory. So House File 1635 uses revenue from the mortgage registry tax and deed tax to help fund the construction of affordable housing. The Workforce Home Ownership Development Fund was created in 2016 as a separate and complementary fund within the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency to increase the production of entry-level single-family homes. It's important to note that dollars in the fund must be balanced 50-50 between Greater Minnesota and the metro area. The fund received a one-time appropriation of $750,000 in 2016 and now receives a similar amount annually to support affordable home ownership statewide. But we know that the need for workforce housing is so much greater than that. Uh, so this bill aims to boost the funding for this program by ensuring that at least $15 million is de directed to the fund and allowing for the issuing of loans uh, in addition to grants to give Minnesota housing more flexibility in how these particular funds are used. It's important to have as many tools as possible available to address the affordable housing challenges here in Minnesota. And this bill will create continuity and funding predictability for programs and projects moving forward. Thank you so much. Um, we'll go to your testifier, Mr. Washburn. Hello, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Gomez. Thank you, Vice Chair Norris, uh, committee members. My name is Jeff Washburn. I'm the Executive Director with the City of Lakes Community Land Trust, community land trust that serves the City of Minneapolis. I also serve as co-chair of the Home Ownership Minnesota, or HOME Coalition. Uh, the HOME Coalition is made up of members that include uh, community land trusts, Habitat for Humanity organizations, uh, CAP organizations, uh, counseling organizations uh, supported by the Home Ownership Center, as well as manufactured housing. So by and large, uh, pretty much every nonprofit affordable home ownership provider is part of the Home Ownership Coalition. Collectively, uh, every year we serve hundreds, if not thousands, if you include, if you include households who are counseled into home ownership, post-purchase, those kinds of things of Minnesota, Minnesotans every year. And we also uh, are very proud to, to share that we, we serve households of color at, at a rate of two to six times the rate of the local population or geography served by our organizations. Uh, here, um, thanking uh, Vice Chair Norris uh, to support House File 1635. Uh, as, as shared, um, Minnesota Housing uh, invests in affordable home ownership, and over the past 10 years uh, has invested approximately 10 to $15 million a year, uh, depending on the year, um, over the past 10 years to help our organizations produce 100 to 150 uh, affordable home ownership opportunities every year. Um, 
it's not enough. We're losing ground um, <coughs> on, on so many fronts. And you know, speaking from my own organization's experience, uh, we're a small, small office, seven employees. Uh, we, we assist 30 to 40 households a year get into home ownership. Um, and we apply for any year, at least over the last few years, three to four million dollars a year. So the, the, the workforce and affordable home ownership fund is just, it's currently funded is, is a fraction of what our organization applies for. And our organization is typically awarded somewhere around 50% of that amount awarded, which is a significant investment by the state. Um, it's also leveraged typically two to one from other sources of funding. So I, I'd like to say that it's a really good leverage for the state of, of Minnesota as well. My experience, I think, is very similar to the other affordable home ownership providers in the state in that we could be serving a whole heck of a lot more folks. Uh, at any given time, my organization has 10 to 20 households uh, waiting to get into home ownership, uh, and we just run out of funds every year. And I think uh, creation of the work of, of this investment into the Workforce and Affordable Home Ownership Fund would create some predictability um, so that we're not going to have to keep coming back year after year. Uh, asking just to make sure that we can start to plot and think about what the future years are going to create for for our organizations. It's tough to really plan and, 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 and invest like our organization would like to if there aren't a pre predictable amount of dollars that we can apply for every year from the state of Minnesota. Um, at long term, I mean, the ground we're not making on, on, on assisting Minnesotans into home ownership. Um, it's not getting any better. Um, I think a long-term solution is needed and we believe that a fund like this would help us get to that. Um, the ongoing commitment and support of affordable home ownership uh, would provide confidence to our organizations to plan and, and, and look, for look for opportunities that would further affordable uh, home ownership in the state. And as shared by, by Vice Chair Norris, it's another tool in the toolbox and we need as many tools as we can to, to, to solve this, this problem that we have in the state. Um, I, I like this as a source because there is such a nexus to uh, the, the, the increased uh, housing costs in the state, the number of transactions, and our hope is that uh, this ties along with the other production that, that, that happens in the state and this, these dollars would benefit lower income households into home ownership. Just in closing, I've been with the organization that I serve for 20 years. Uh, in those early days, I was the sole staff person. I got to go to the closings. I got to see first time, first generation buyers break down in tears, um, never thinking they'd be able to achieve home ownership. And I miss going to those closings. My other colleagues get to do that now. But the thing I do appreciate now is touching base with a homeowner who purchased their home two, three years ago and asking them what's changed in their life. and and. Yes, they definitely have more stability for themselves, their children. They're not displaced by their landlord. They're keeping their kids in the same school. But the thing that I've really kind of caught on to in these conversations is the confidence that homeowners have. They never thought that they'd ever achieve home ownership. <coughs> they achieved that goal. And now all of a sudden they're going back to school, getting the adult certificates. They're getting a new job. They're, they're investing back in their communities in a way that they never thought that they would. And I think that this goes way beyond affordable home ownership and it really gets to the folks that we're serving. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I, the last time we had Mr. Washburn in front of the property tax committee, I had to share a little bit because he's actually moving on from his position. But, um, you know, as he mentioned, has been working in this area for 20 years and we're really grateful um, for all of your work and, and you know the impact that you've had on this issue is really enormous and so we appreciate it. Um, we're on a lot of top five, top 10 lists uh, in our state and one of the unfortunate top five, top 10 lists we're on is having some of the deepest home ownership disparities between people of color and white people in the country. And um, we didn't get there, uh, we got there because of policy decisions and we will not get out of it without making different policy decisions. And so I know that this is an issue that is being um, considered really carefully in the Housing Committee and representatives, Representative Agbaje has a first time home buyer um, down payment assistance program and Representative Agbaje and Howard's, Chair Howard's uh, committee, they were working a lot on this, but um, we know that in our, in, you know, with this, with this fund, you know, we're trying to do our part to, um, you know, to help with this particular piece, which is the production piece, which is especially hard. I just was reading this 
article in the paper about how like even as interest rates have gone up and um, the you know kind of the churn in the market has slowed down some we're not seeing prices come down and so you know this a fund really helps to uh, to get to that issue so um, rep to member discussion uh, representative Robbins thank you madam chair and thank you for your work on this issue it really is important to all of our communities I do have a couple questions about um, what's going on here however so first could you tell me why it looks like it's creating a new um, workforce and afford affordable home ownership development account within the housing development fund why is that necessary um, should we go to you mr. Washburn take a shot madam. all right sounds good we can go to nonpartisan too if we need more info of representative Robbins currently at the at the housing finance agency uh, there is a, a tool a mechanism by which we 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 seek funding it's called the challenge fund that that fund funds both affordable rental and affordable home ownership the workforce and affordable home ownership fund uh, as i understand it when established in 2016 was really to set aside funds for affordable home ownership looking to increase um, the dollars that go into affordable home ownership i've done this analysis uh, in recent years but you know over that 10-year run, uh, the last calculation I do and it, did it a couple of years ago, only approximately 4% of the, house, the state of Minnesota, Minnesota housing's um, allocations each year would go toward affordable home ownership. The vast majority of the dollars go to affordable rental, which is a very important thing. But what we're trying to do is, is create more dollars for affordable home ownership by establishing this fund. Representative Robbins. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, this might be more to the author, I'm not sure, but on the amendment, it says that a borrower may, instead of repaying the loan, spend the money on qualified projects under subdivision two, which then, you know, so they could, instead of repaying the loan, use it for development costs, rehab, land development, residential housing, including storm shelters. Why are we not having it just about the loan repayment? Because otherwise, there are grants. So. So could you explain why we're going down this path? Thank you. Representative Norris. Chair Gomez, I, I, <laughs> I think that actually, you know, that is the intent of, of the advocates who brought the bill. So I think Mr. Washburn might be better suited to explain kind of the motivation for why, why we crafted the bill that way. Mr. Washburn. Madam Chair, Re Representative. Um, the currently, uh, and, I, and I, I actually think that this amendment may have come from the agency uh, seeking to, to also include the loan language. Currently, uh, when, when affordable home ownership projects are funded, if, if the dollars are going to what we call development gap or the difference between what it costs to build the property and, and the appraised value, uh, there, there's not the ability to make a loan to that. So the agency typically uh, invests those dollars as grants, as development gap, uh, by, as development gap. gap. Um, in the case of affordability dollars, so if these dollars are used to, to, to bring down the cost to a lower income buyer from that appraised value to the affordable price, uh, in some instances, the agency puts those dollars out as loans, uh, essentially to the, the low income home buyer that are returned upon resale or refinance. In the case of long term affordable ownership opportunities like a community land trust or Habitat for Humanity, anything, any entity that's able to keep the homes affordable beyond 30 years, the agency structured those funds as grants. So my understanding is that the agency was looking to um, steward the state dollars by making loans in instances where the dollars were invested as affordability gap, but not to long-term affordable organizations. Am I, am, am I clear? <laughs> Representative Robbins? Absolutely not. Um, I would love to get some more clarification on this, um, either today or at some point before we take the bill up, because I do think it's really important <coughs> yeah. to make sure we're understanding how this is going to function. Thank you. Yes, great. Um, I, yeah, I know, I know that, you know, for the land trust and habitat and other projects that there is sort of affordability that stays with the home, not with the like person who's living in the home. And so that's what the way that I read this is sort of that it is um, allowing for that, you know, we talk about land trust and, and, and the habitat homes as like perpetual affordability. So it's not just like for the term when the individual is staying in the home, that it's that it that in a community that you would have these affordable home ownership opportunities that even when that first home buyer that gets in there 
like leaves, then it would still main the subsidy would stay with the house. But I might be misunderstanding it, and we will get you some follow up information um, from the agency on that. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair, and you know I appreciate your work and advocacy on affordable housing. I know in your community it's much different than a community like uh, like Lakeville and some of the other areas that I represent. Uh, why aren't we just doing a 10-year, $15 million annual appropriation and, and not tying it to the mortgage registration tax? Um, because I have some concerns with that. Uh, because as a former mortgage lender and realtor, um, I've sat at the closing table with many customers and had to explain uh, why they're getting taxed on this and it's based on the value of their house, it's based on the value of their transfer. And I know within the bill, it's supposed to half supposed to go outside the metro and half in the metro. Um, I would like to see it even stay a little closer if you're going to tie it to something like that. But why aren't we just making a direct appropriation? Because we could make other um, arguments that the local jurisdictions or the local county, which is technically who receives the money, I think, and then it comes to the Department of Revenue. Um, or they get a part and it goes to revenue. You know, there's a lot of other needs uh, per jurisdictions that charge this, roads, schools, um, health care, uh, a whole variety of, variety of other needs that the general fund is where we put those dollars and then we have a discussion here at the legislature of how to appropriate that. And I know it's not always the most efficient or streamlined function, but that's our job to do is to figure out uh, where we're going to prioritize those general fund dollars. Um, and so why aren't we just doing a general fund appropriation to this? Because there are many other needs that we can um, argue that a deed tax or a mortgage registration tax uh, should remain more local um, if we're going to go this route. Representative Norris. Yeah, Chair Gomez and Representative Kosnick, I can take a swing at that. And uh, this is actually a proposal that's been around for, for a couple of years now and, and um, really kind of you know, stems from what we've been seeing, what the chair kind of talked about, where we're seeing this, this broadening gap open up as home values increase. We're seeing you know, a, a, a surge in, in what we were collecting in terms of the deed tax and the mortgage registry tax at the same time that many of our, our neighbors were struggling to be able to get into home ownership. And I think the idea behind the bill was to tap into that source of revenue that we're seeing because of um, some great gains that part of the housing market was experiencing and using that funding to make sure that we're supporting the workforce housing that uh, many of our neighbors were struggling to be able to get into. Excellent. Uh, Representative Kosnick. Thank you. And I, I appreciate why, why you think there's a connection there, but I think the needs are much broader than just affordable housing. And as a mortgage lender, I'll tell you, um, not everybody's going to the closing table because they're buying a new house and they're excited about it. Sometimes they're getting divorced and there's financial pressure and they're having to buy two houses and we're taxing them, uh, those families again. And more often, there's a lot of times people are coming to the closing table to refinance, to pay for debt because they're already taxed uh, a lot and have other financial pressures on there. So, you know, if you want to fix affordable housing a little bit, maybe we should be giving them a, a break just on the mortgage registration tax and the deed tax to begin with um, rather than re redistributing it. I think a better way to do it, and Representative Norris, you had a bill the, here the other day and I was agreeing with uh, too many of your tax bills. This is one I don't agree with. <laughs> Let's just put it a, take a general fund appropriation if we as a legislature think that's important, uh, which I think you can make that case. Uh, we do have uh, some resources now uh, and maybe I would support it more likely in that way than to tie it to a mortgage registration tax for 10 years um, <clears throat> because there are other needs and I don't, I'm not comfortable with the, this mechanism. Thank you, Representative Kosnick. Uh, Representative Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair Gomez, Representative Norris. Uh, not surprisingly, I'm a, I'm a big supporter of this and uh, Representative Kosnick does raise a good question and I think we've had some version of that uh, question in, in terms of what is the role of our tax code to support things that we value as a community. I would say in housing, it's an area where we have persistently underinvested, and it's an issue where the crisis has gotten worse and worse and worse. 
Um, and part of the reason why this proposal has been around, it has been that persistent underinvestment, has been the fact that we have a housing budget that represents 0.4% of our state general fund budget. Um, I, I give this analogy, if our entire state general fund budget was a gallon of jug of water, we spend less than a tablespoon on housing. And it, so we should have those debates about whether that's the right uh, uh, amount, but that is sort of the, the backdrop I see this as, is we need to be looking at all the tools, all the ways we can support this critical need all across our state, which is why I really appreciate a mechanism that's tied to a specific housing um, uh, con concern in our tax code and directing that resource to a critical need. So I think it makes a lot of sense uh, in our context and I think we should be looking at general fund dollars too. It can be sort of a yes and the, the challenge we're up in housing um, kind of warrants that in my, in my opinion. So thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair Howard. Uh, Chair Joaquin. Thank you, uh, Chair Gomez. And he's told everything I was gonna say. I was gonna say, yes, this has to be a yes and. And it does make sense And we do this in other areas of our um, statutes. We charge a fee on homeowners insurance that goes to our firefighters in our fire safety account to make sure that they're talking to people about how to prevent fires in their homes and saving insurance companies money for that reason. So having something like this directly tied and it's just part of that going into this fund to go beyond what you've been able to do because as you said so eloquently there is way more need out there than what this fund is being able to provide. So thank you for bringing up this bill, Representative Norris. Representative Joy, we're getting tight on time just so folks know. It'll be short. Uh, one of the questions I have for Representative Norris is, in here it says residential housing, including storm shelters and related community facilities. What does the uh, community facilities, I guess, what, what defines that in there or how do we know what is a community facility when uh, Chair Gomez, I, I have a guess, but rather than having me guess if our nonpartisan staff has a an answer that they're hundred percent certain on, we'll go with that. Uh, Mr. Cope. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Joy, I would have to get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying if we're gonna do a housing thing, I just want to make sure it focuses on the housing and not gets off in the woods on something. Chair Chair Gomez yes. and Representative Joy. Representative Norris. I, you know, one of the things that I think this might be related to is, is the manufactured housing context um, where you have a, a community um, that there may be things like a storm shelter or other, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm guessing that this isn't meaning something, you know, recreational like a swimming pool, but kind of more, you know, key utility type things that would support um, the infrastructure for a, a manufactured housing community or, or some other residential community like that. Okay, Representative thank you. Joy. Thank you. Great, thanks. It sounds like we'll do some follow-up on that. Uh, any further member discussion? Seeing none, Representative uh, Norris, any yeah. final words? Uh, thanks, Chair Gomez, and thanks to, to the members for a great discussion on this bill. I think there's you know, broad agreement that we need to tackle our, our housing affordability crisis, um, you know, different ways that we can approach it. I think as many tools we can bring to the table, the better, uh, and I think House File 1635 delivers on that. All right, thank you so much. And uh, with that, uh, Representative Norris is going to renew his motion that House File 1635, the first engrossment as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill, and it is laid over. Uh, Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, do we have taxes tomorrow? We do not have taxes okay. tomorrow. I was just gonna cover schedule. We're meeting on Thursday, and uh, stay tuned to your email, because we're gonna, you know, have, uh, we have a bunch of work to do in the next couple weeks here, so. Tax song, uh, Representative Kosnick is asking about tax songs. Well, you're gonna have to talk to Representative Davids because I believe he is a self-appointed um, <laughs> choir leader on the tax song uh, question. So uh, thanks everyone. Um, like I said, next time we're meeting is Thursday, March 23rd. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>